Hello folks, my name is Dr. Zachary Hildenbrand. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Kevin Shug, and we are the Collaborative Laboratories for Environmental Analysis and Remediation at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're coming to you from the uh, Responsible Shale Energy Extraction Conference, which is a very unique event, bringing together scientists, concerned citizens, operators, regulators, and technology companies to have an honest series of conversations about environmental stewardship in shale energy. We'd really like to thank the support of the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation and Earth Day Texas for allowing us to put on this event. Uh, we believe that this content that we're going to be providing to those who haven't been able to attend is going to help answer and educate a lot of questions surrounding responsible shale energy extraction. So we hope you enjoy the content. Um, I have a, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Dr. Inez Santos, who's going to talk to you. She came as a, as, a, as a graduate student and stayed in my lab for a number of months. Um, and then uh, went back to Portugal to finish her PhD. Really wanted to come back and start working with this. Um, she has a microbiology background, but she was focused on analytical chemistry. As she came to learn more about what we were doing, she started to say, hey, why don't we start looking for some of the microbial, uh, um, some of the microbiome, some of the microbial populations that exist in some of these waters. So she's going to tell you some of the, the research that's going on there. Uh, these are work that's just being put out for publication. I think brand, brand new stuff that uh, is going to be very interesting for you to hear about. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Santos. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes. <laughs> um, thank you for staying for my presentation. I know it's the last one, so I appreciate you being here. I wanted to talk about microbiology. I know it's a little bit different from what we've been hearing. Since uh, now, we've been hearing about the chemicals, and I want you to think about what about microorganisms, right? They also have a very important role in our life. Basically, this is a leaf life planet because of microorganisms, and not because of us. So they're really important, though. I mean, yes. Um, so environmental microbiology basically studies uh, microorganisms that we cannot see um, in water, soil, um, air, and why is it important to study them? Because there's a lot of information we can take from uh, microorganisms in the environment. They produce a lot of uh, very important products like antibiotics that we need them. Their interactions can also tell us a lot about how the environment is, how it is polluted or not, and also how they will re recycle all the nutrients in the, for example, the water. Uh, so there's a lot of studies that can be done um, in the environmental microbiology, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, related to uh, hydraulic fracturing, I guess people are only concerned about what are the disadvantages of having microbes in these processes. And so it is really important to know what microorganisms are present because they can uh, cause corrosion, they can produce acid, and then that can um, have a negative impact in the process itself. But in this work we wanted to look at the other side of uh, the story, which is um, what about what happens to the microorganisms when we impact these waters with contaminants? And how does that impact us since we're using the water to drink? There's actually been some studies where uh, people are trying to figure out how these uh, impacts cause some changes in the water microbiome. So in this paper, people studied um, how the, micro, the surface water microbiome changed due to uh, pollution and they could actually see there's a, a change when the water is polluted. So it is, uh, we can use these microorganisms as an indicator of water pollution also. There's a lot of sources for water pollution, They're mainly from anthropogenic sources. So it's not only hydraulic fracturing, but we can also pollute these waters with septic tanks, for example. But we in this work, we're trying to relate how the hydraulic fracturing can actually cause changes in the water microbiome. And also, when we look at the water microbiome, we want to understand, are there any pathogens in there? And also, are there any organic degraders? Because if there's any de organic degraders, we can use them in the future to bioremediate these waters. Usually, the techniques that are used for identifying microorganisms any place are very tedious and time-consuming. I don't know if you ever heard about sequencing, and they are also very expensive. 
And we want a technique that can overcome all these disadvantages. We want a technique that's high throughput and allows us a fast identification of the water microbiome. Um, so, in this work, we used matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, time of flight mass spectrometry. It's a very big name, it, but we basically call it as Maldi Tau MS. And what it does is analyzes um, protein profile of microorganisms. So, we have a library uh, of all the proteins of a microorganism, and when we analyze an unknown, this unknown is going to be compared with the library, and we're going to have an ID. And as you can see, this is a mass spectrum of different microorganisms. They're actually different between each microorganism. And that's what allows us to have a fingerprint of each microorganism and have an identification. And this procedure mainly takes a minute for each uh, sample. So it's really quick, and that's what we want. when We want um, real-time analysis of a water sample. This is just an example of how it looks like, the software. So what we want to see is a green, uh, basically a green panel of all the identifications means it has a 90% match score at least of that identification. In this work, we also wanted to kind of couple culturomics with the Malditoff MS, which means we wanted to explore different culture media to be able to recover as much as possible from the water samples. Um, and so the main goal of this work was to study the groundwater microbiome and also relate the changes of that microbiome with possible anthropogenic contaminations. We collected different water samples around Texas and uh, we did some um, in situ, um, I forget the word, so we monitored that, work, that water samples in situ and after that we brought them to the lab, oh it's actually working the video, so, we, uh, in a sterile environment, what we do is that we filter the water sample through a 0.2 micromembrane. And what that does is that it allows us to pre-concentrate all the microorganisms in that membrane. And after that, we take the membrane out and we put it in the culture media. And we incubate during, night, during the night and let them grow in different culture media. Okay. So this is just an example of different water samples that were filtered and you can see actually the color of the filter showing how different they are. And these are the results that we get at the end where you can see the colonies on the surface of the filters. And according to the number of the microorganisms, you'll see more or less colonies in that surface of the membrane. And after that, we kind of take that colony off and put it in a multi plate, that little thing you see in the video, and we put that plate in the instrument, and that's what's going to give us an identification. As you can see, it's going to give that, that, that profile that's going to allow the identification of the microorganism. So in the water samples that we analyzed, we mainly found proteobacteria, which are mainly heterotrophic bacteria, which means they're able to degrade organic compounds in the water samples. And this is a good thing, because if the water is contaminated with hydrocarbons, they can actually degrade these compounds into less toxic ones. We also found some coliforms, which was very interesting, because in the water samples that were present near a septic tank, we found high levels of nitrate and also coliforms in there, which is basically they're coming from uh, human feces. So it is important to understand that um, this water uh, samples can have pathogenic bacteria in there. Um, which this was what I was talking about. We also found some denitrifying bacteria which are able to reduce nitrate into nitrogen gas. And also some of the bacteria showed high tolerance to metals. And this is another important factor that I will explain later. So we were able to kind of relate the presence of the uh, chemical compounds like inorganic compounds and organic compounds with bacteria. And we were able to kind of figure it out with looking at these graphics, that uh, nitrates and sulfates kind of give us an idea of the number of bacteria present in that water sample. So there are good uh, indicators of the qualitative analysis of the bacteria. Um, and then we were able to see that TOC is actually reflective of the abundance of the diversity. Uh, the other aspect that I wanted to talk about is uh, the pathogenicity of this bacteria, because all of the ones that we isolated are um, 
path they can be pathogenic bacteria. They're known for being opportunistic pathogenic bacteria, which means they'll infect children, immunocompromised persons, and elderly people. And actually, WHO just came out with this list of the bacteria that need new antibiotics because of resistance to almost all of the existing antibiotics. And uh, Pseudomonas was the first one on the list, and we found uh, different strains of it in the water sample. And as you can see, EPA, so the EPA doesn't really regulate these water wells since they're private wells, so we should do that work to let people know if there's actually patho pathogenic bacteria in the water wells. And when they regulate the drinking water, they mainly only look at coliforms and heterotrophic bacteria, which doesn't really tell us much. So I do think this regulation should be a little bit, um, should, more work should be put into it, and more bacteria should be included in this list, such as, for example, Pseudomonas, that's not there. And what they tell us to do is that when you have a contaminated water sample, you should disinfect it with probably using chloride or filter and probably boil it. Um, and we've noticed that some bacteria are actually present in the water that's chlorinated. So it's not a very effective way to clean the water. People think it is, but it may not be. So it is time to be serious. <laughs> uh, after that, we tested all the identifications we used, uh, we, we did with the Malditoff MS. We wanted to make sure they were accurate, so we did sequencing of the, the, this bacteria. And you can see, actually, the Malditoff MS was very accurate, so it can be used as a technique to identify the bacteria in the water sample. We also did some antibiotic susceptibility, like I said, um, all of those bacteria are opportunistic pathogens, so it is important to know their resistances. And there is a concern about Bacillus and Pseudomonas bacteria because they show a lot of resistances to the antibiotics tested. Uh, it, again, the presence of bacteria that are tolerant to metals have shown, like, the present. So what I want to say is that when the bacteria are present in these conditions, like in the presence of pollutants, high levels of metals, they can develop more pathogenic um, virulence. Um, so how can I say it? I'm sorry. So they can get more virulent when in the presence of these um, pollutants. So it is important to understand that they can get uh, resistant to more antibiotics when in these stressful environments. So when we have water polluted, uh, these bacteria may change and they may be friendly and nice, but at the end they may become pathogenic and that's very important to understand and study. So there's a lot of fields that we are currently working on and we want to do in the future. Uh, it's a very interesting work. So we can use this bacteria to remediate the water samples, the soil. We can also, like I said, uh, try to understand how the presence of these pollutants may uh, turn these bacteria into more pathogenic strains. Um, for example, I know people are using biocides in the fracking field to kill the bacteria, but there are some studies showing that when the presence in, of these biocides, uh, they become more violent. So it is important to understand that we think we're doing a good work, but we're making it worse. So as a conclusion, uh, it was possible to see that each groundwater showed a very unique microbiome. Uh, that the organic and inorganic compounds do influence the type of bacteria that we see in the water. And it was not possible with these water samples to kind of link the hydraulic fracturing activities with the changes in the microbiome, but it is a work that we want to do in the future and we are currently, currently working on it. Um, so, and additionally, we do want to, we are currently also working in trying to understand if these bacteria are able to remediate the water samples we want to increase the library of the microorganisms to include more environmental strains. And mainly in the future, if we want to use the bacteria to remediate the water, maybe apply bacteriophages to remediate the bacteria in the water. Well, I'm free to talk to you outside. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to talk to you. And I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Inez, uh, for this presentation. Uh, and I had, you know, there were some questions that came through, and then as they were coming through and collating them, uh, uh, you answered them, you know, okay. in terms of. Yeah.
uh, you know, how they might be treated, uh, what kind of a effects might be there. Um, maybe if you can, uh, I have two, two, two questions. Uh, can you comment on, you know, the potential, so we've been so focused on chemical concentrations mm -hmm. in water. I mean, can you, can you give some context about, you know, where, are the chemical effects, uh, you know, really what we should be worrying about, or how much should we worry about the bacterial side of things in terms of, you know, their variability and how they could be impacting health? Yeah, I think we should be worried about everything, right? The chemicals are also a very important part, but the bacteria are also important because not only they can be pathogenic, like I said, but they can also be a tool to remediate the chemical side, and everything is linked, right? It's, we cannot just study one thing and the other separately. There should be studied together. But I suppose like one of the very difficult parts about uh, regulation is mm -hmm. that you know, these bacteria are naturally occurring, mm -hmm. right? And, yes. And it's, uh, so it's not a, a, it can't make a direct impact, so to speak. So uh, the nature of, of assigning you know, the uh, presence of a bacteria to the, you know, a particular operation may be more difficult, don't you think, because it's another step down the chain? Yes, indeed. But I do think it would be nice if we could relate their pathogenicity, if they become more virulent when exposed to these contaminations. And also, what I, I was reading is that it's interesting that we also have our own bacteria, right? Our own gut microbiome. And when we're drinking this water, or if we're subject to contamination somehow, we can change our own gut microbiome. And that can change and actually have an impact in our uh, health, like we can have diseases related with the gut microbiome. I've seen diabetes is related with it, heart diseases. So it would be interesting if we could link that. Uh, so there's a lot of studies that we can. And just one last thought to mm -hmm. kind of uh, round it out. So we've been talking about environmental impacts here. Do you think that this type of technology, as you described, could be useful also on the industry operator side? For sure. I think, yes, I, that's uh, also one of the reasons we're doing it is showing that they can actually use the bacteria. First of all, they can use it as an indicator of pollution. They can use it as a remediation uh, process. So I think, yes, it would be beneficial for them to use it also. And even maybe in terms of oil recovery, as I understand, sometimes, you know, yes. corrosion is an yes. issue with bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Shug here. Uh, I can say with absolute 100% certainty that this event was a tremendous success. Uh, we had an unbelievable program of world-renowned experts talking about a diverse set of issues, concerns, technologies uh, that are associated with unconventional oil and gas development. This is an incredibly complex issue and uh, we need to inform ourselves about it we need to collaborate more with each other, and uh, I think ultimately that will allow us to be smarter about all this. And so, uh, you know, this has been a lot of work pulling all of this together. Again, as I say, we say we don't get very many Christmas cards, you know, trying to bring all these perspectives together. And uh, but at the end of the day, I think that's where our most, where the we are the most effective, and uh, where we get the most value in society. Yeah, I mean. Uh we, we were talking about this. We, we had 150 registrants for this conference, and we thought yeah. that we'd be even more here. And then, I mean, we really appreciate the attendance that we have here, but then as we start to think about it and see just the amazing content that was, yeah. that was produced, I mean, really, I think, uh, evenly addressing uh, very important issues that uh, we're going to have here a, a very important repository uh, that we're going to put online for people to access to help educate the public to help build a, a close, stronger bridge of communication between yeah. the industry and between scientists, regulators. I think, uh, you know, personally, you know, I've, I've met so many wonderful people here uh, this past two days that I hadn't met before, and yeah, I'm really looking absolutely. forward to the, those interactions. Yeah, and we look forward to doing this bigger, badder uh, next year. That's right. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this again, and we hope that you guys will stay engaged and. Um, 
provide us feedback for uh, you know what you've seen here, what you'd like to see differently. Uh, like I said, we, we need to have that feedback from both sides so that we can keep a good balanced uh, discussion. Um, we will adjourn here, but we don't want you guys to go running away because of a couple of important things. Uh, Professor Verbeck is going to have the car out there on the Esplanade. Very cool. Nice uh, demonstration there with some uh, even video and some of the videos that weren't, weren't able to be shown here. And then we do have our research posters and, and uh, exhibition vendors out in the automobile uh, building. Uh, please go by and, and um, uh, talk to the students who've done the research, see some of the data, and, and uh, give them some feedback if you get a chance. Yes, uh, and on the, on the particular car, I mean, you'll absolutely fall in love with it. I know when we introduced it to the Eagle Ford Shale, you know, I now get hounded uh, by our friends down there to bring it out there more often. Um, so it's a really powerful tool, and it really epitomizes where this whole thing is going. New technologies, more innovation, uh, more diversity, more collaboration, and it's a really, really exciting new frontier. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's been really positive. We look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thank you.